I am going to start with this picture. No? We often think about the brain and cognition as something isolated, uh, swimming in a liquid and very abstract that we can put in a computer or transfer a mind from one, one body to the other or from one computer to the other. And in contrast to this uh, view, I will present mm, our view on uh, the origin of nervous systems or at least some uh, uh, simple forms of nervous system that may tell us something about simple forms of uh, this brain-body coupling. So my group is interested in this beautiful uh, larvae, ciliated larvae from marine zooplankton, and I will tell you um, some of the neuronal circuit and behavior of work we have done on, uh, on in particular one group of these uh, zooplankton larvae. And uh, this is the organism that we studied most, Platinaris dumerilii. It's a marine annelid with an established laboratory culture. So we can keep them even in Heidelberg, far away from any sea, uh, in seawater aquaria. And uh, there's a closed life cycle, so we can have access to, uh, to the eggs and the larvae daily. So we, we can micro-inject and do genetics, RNA injections, imaging. And we are particularly interested in these early larval stages that are part of the zooplankton. So swimming uh, for a few days in the open ocean and then settling on the substrate. So how do these uh, larvae behave and what do they do? Just uh, uh, before getting to the larva, I show you this spectacular spawning and nuptial dance of the adults. Uh, this is uh, a spawning that you can sometimes observe uh, in the ocean if, uh, if there's some bright light close to the shore. The female bursts, releases the eggs, the male uh, frantically fertilizes the eggs, and then they both die. It's a very romantic type of reproduction. <laughs> uh, but then the next uh, couple of days, we have in beakers uh, swimming and synchronously developing zooplankton larvae, uh, so thousands of individuals that are developing very stereotypically and have very similar uh, behaviors and nervous systems that we can then study. So to understand the, the nervous system and this brain-body coupling, we wanted to look at the entire thing, the entire body and the entire brain. And so we have uh, acquired the full body Transmission electron microscopy a data set of this entire larva, 5,000 sections, imaged at uh, 3 nanometer resolution, and then reconstructed uh, by skeletonization of all the cells. Uh, we have all the neurons, and every single cell, it's roughly 10,000 cells, are individually annotated and skeletonized. So we know a lot about the nervous system architecture and connectivity. This is the nervous system. So the blue dots are the individual basal bodies of the locomotor cilia. These larvae swim with cilia. They have 10,000 locomotor cilia. And the uh, orange is the nerve tracks uh, of roughly 2,000 neurons. It's a nice rope ladder nervous system, centralized uh, ventral nerve cord and brain, and uh, peripheral nervous system. And uh, so every neuron is individually annotated, and all the synapses are tagged, so we have the synaptic connectome. This is something similar than what uh, we have seen for uh, C. elegans, for example. It's just 10 times larger. It's a whole body connectome, not only including the, the nervous system, but also all the effector systems, which is not only muscles, as often misleadingly people claim. It also includes cilia, glands, uh, pigment cells, um, and sometimes also glia cells. So there are four or five effector systems in animal bodies. Now, um, I am going to tell you then how we approach behavior and embodied cognition uh, through uh, three or four different examples. And uh, the, uh, the first one is uh, phototaxis. So uh, if you look at these early larvae and switch on light, they all swim towards the light. Now, you could say better than rats, maybe not as good as lipid droplets, but uh, so it's a pretty convincing behavior, and this is mediated by uh, the simplest circuit that I am aware of. It's a circuit of a single neuron. This is a light-sensing neuron, a photoreceptor that is shaded by a pigment cup, so it has directional sensitivity to light, and the photoreceptor directly innervates the ciliated cells on, on one side, and when light hits this photoreceptor, which is directional because of the pigment, then the adjacent cilia slow down the beating, and this elicits a small turn in the trajectory. So the larvae need to swim 
in a helical manner, as many microswimmers with cilia do. So in this, in this helical fashion, and as they rotate, they scan with their eyes, the directional pigmented eye spots, and every time there is a directional input to the photoreceptor, this slows down the cilia, and there is a gradual adjustment of the trajectory towards light. So this uh, we could uh, simulate in a computer simulation, and what you see here is a parameter analysis, and what is most important is this spin uh, parameter, which tells the rotation of the body. If you take out the spinning, then the phototactic ability drops to zero. So what uh, this revealed us that yes, you can have one neuron circuit, but it only works uh, together with the mo movement pattern. So the body rotation and the movement of the body uh, is essential to get the behavior. You can't just put this single responsive sensory neuron onto whatever body. It's not going to work only if you have the proper uh, helically rotating body and the proper orientation and position of the sensors. So the next example is about uh, um, the body-wide coordination of some of the activities. So some of the theories of the origin of nervous system posit that nervous systems didn't evolve for sensing, but they evolved to actually coordinate large multicellular bodies because when large bodies evolved with lots of muscles, uh, one task was to, to coordinate the activity to have some kind of coherent motion of contractions from some kind of crawling. And uh, we have that in the, in the animal, such coordinated activity. In, in this video, you can see the segmentally arranged locomotor cilia, so this part of these 10,000 locomotor cilia. And you can see that they are very regular, but completely coordinated closures, arrests of all the cilia in the body. And when this happens, of course, the animal stops swimming. So if you want to stop, you have to stop all the motors, otherwise you would kind of uh, turn sideways or do weird things. And this uh, coordinated stopping or arrest of the cilia is ensured by the activity of these two gigantic uh, motor neurons, these are cholinergic motor neurons that are driven by a pacemaker system, but these span the entire body and these two neurons collectively innervate all the 80 multiciliated cells and when these are active, then the cilia shut down. So in this case, the nervous system has a function which is to coordinate all the effectors that are distributed along all the segments. Now, the, <clears throat> when is this used? There are spontaneous arrests, but the system is also engaged, uh, for example, during this very nice startle response, which we can just elicit by tapping on the microscope stage. Then the larvae stop swimming and they extend their parapodia. And, um, we can visualize this in, in this tethered larvae, and these are uh, beads to visualize the flow. And what you see is when this tungsten needle vibrates, so it's a hydrodynamic uh, sensation, then uh, the, cilia, the flow stops, so they arrest all the cilia. And if the vibration is stronger, then they also contract the body. So if uh, there is a mutant, in a mechanosensory channel that mediates this hydrodynamic sensing, then there is no uh, response to vibration. And this ion channel, it's a polycystin-like channel, is expressed in these sensory neurons that are the vibration receptors that we mapped and characterized. And we know from the connectome that these neurons uh, eventually, uh, through an interneuron, will synapse on these gigantic motor neurons that control the cilia. So we think this is the sensory motor pathway to arrest the cilia coordinatedly in the body. And uh, why do they need to do this? So one um, <clears throat> uh, very important ecological uh, factor is these copepod predators. So these are mechanosensory hydrodynamic predators. They have these huge antennae, and they can sense the trails, like the lipid droplets had this chemical trail. The zooplankton has a biophysical trail in the, in the water, in the disturbances of the hydrodynamics. And the copepod follows that and then eats the, the zooplankton. So, but uh, if, you, if you either hide by stopping the cilia or you arrest by extending these uh, bristles, then the copepod cannot eat you. If you take away uh, this ability from the, from the platinae race, This 
is such a shame. Well, what you see here is the mutant is eaten, and it's, it's very uh, unfortunate but that, that it's not running, but uh, you can believe me. So also here, this whole body coordination of, of the action is important for predator avoidance. Now, another example where actually this whole body control and, and understanding the behavior requires understanding the body is important is uh, this pressure response. So uh, zooplankton is sensitive to pressure. We know it for, for a long time, but hasn't been clear how this works. So if you pressurize the larvae, this is the work of Luis Bezares, who built this pressure uh, device where you can precisely control the pressure and then video image the larvae, then what he sees is that the larvae start to swim up as uh, um, to compensate for the increased pressure. And in this chamber, Louis can very precisely control the level of pressure. And so when he pressurizes the larvae to different extent, then he sees that there is a graded response. So the more pressure, the, the stronger is the upward swimming. And this is we think is a mechanism of compensation of barotaxis. So as the larva uh, drift or sinks down or there's a downwelling current, it upregulates the swimming to swim up. And uh, what uh, is really the question here that I will come back to, how do they uh, swim up? How do they know what is up? So first of all, uh, they upregulate the swimming speed. There's a change in the trajectory. So the helices, instead of swimming like this, they swim really in straight uh, helices. And <coughs> This is due to a change in the ciliary beating, which we can measure with this high-speed video. As you can see, this beautiful metachronic coordination. And if you pressurize them to um, a thousand bars, uh, there is a big increase in ciliary beat frequency. But increases already occur at lower, lower frequencies. And this uh, change in the frequency only happens in the head, ciliary band. And this is because the sensory cells that sense pressure are in the head. These are uh, these spectacular ciliary photoreceptor cells with these highly ramified cilia. We have shown physiologically and genetically that these mediate pressure sensing. There are four of these cells, and uh, these um, connect through a synaptic uh, circuit, which we mapped in the connectome, to the head ciliary band, which is called the prototroch. And they do this through these uh, serotonergic and cholinergic <coughs> ciliomotor neurons. So this is the circuit that drives this behavior. If you activate the photoreceptors, you activate serotonergic motor neuron, which activates the ciliary beating, the frequency increases, and this leads to a faster and upward swimming. So <coughs> this is the morphology of this head serotonergic neurons. There are two of them, and this ring here is the main nerve that innervates only the head, the head ciliate itself. So the strong cilia don't receive input from this pressure sensory system. Now, what, <clears throat> and then you have a compensation, yeah? So if you are drifting down, you will swim up. Now, what was actually very uh, interesting about this system that these photoreceptors also mediate UV avoidance behavior. So the same uh, sensory cells can be activated by light. They are UV sensory and they mediate a downward swimming behavior, which was really puzzling initially. But uh, if you look at these videos, we switch on uh, non-directional UV light. And if you just look at these trajectories, uh, there is, uh, relative to the darkness, when the trajectories go up and down, there is now, they start to kick in and start to become blue, which means that the trajectory moves down. So there is a strong downward swimming um, of the larvae. And if you look at the action spectrum of this response, this happens with the maximal sensitivity around 360, 380 nanometers of light, which is UV range. Now, this is uh, the UV sensing is mediated by an opsin, which we know from biochemical reconstruction. This is a 384 absorbing photopigment that is formed by the ciliary opsin, which is very specific to these ciliary photoreceptors. If the, we knock out this opsin gene, then there is no downward swimming to UV light. So this is the wild type. They swim down. The knockouts don't swim down. 
And uh, what is really <coughs> puzzling about this response, if you look at the, this is now calcium signals recorded from the ciliary photoreceptors during a U UV pulse, you have this kind of biphasic, triphasic response, up, down, and then there is this late activation, which is decoupled from the UV. So even if the UV is off, they show this late phase activation. And uh, through a series of uh, experiments, we could show that this late phase activation is mediated by nitric oxide, this gaseous signaling molecule, that is uh, specifically produced by the one class of postsynaptic interneurons. And uh, we could measure the production of nitric oxide by this uh, sensor in the neuropil of the brain. So if when they sense UV, the nitric oxide starts to be produced. And this feeds back to the <coughs> ciliary photoreceptors. If you take out nitric oxide synthase from these interneurons, or from actually from the whole larva by a mutation, then you don't get downward swimming. So the wild type swims down to UV light, and the mutants, two different genotypes, don't swim down. Now, um, <clears throat> what happens to this uh, photoreceptor response? So this is the structure of the CRISPR mutants. I told you that in the wild type, there's this triphasic response up, down, and up. And this up, this late up phase does not happen in the NOS mutant. It's completely gone. And uh, also the UV avoidance behavior is completely gone. Now, so we build this mathematical model because we call this, um, this is nitric oxide mediated reverse signaling, but it's with a delay. It's with a delay of uh, roughly 30 seconds and it's maintained for roughly half a minute after the, so post stimulus. So you don't need to have the stimulus on. This is still happening. So the UV will induce a state change in the activity of the circuit. So we call it a short term memory because the, the behavior is maintained uh, Half, uh, roughly half a minute after the stimulus. Now, and if we run these mathematical models of the circuit, then what you can see is that the longer the stimulation, the larger this post-stimulus uh, nitric oxide dependent uh, shorter memory becomes. So what uh, uh, I wanted to add this shorter memory part here, because I think what uh, I just made this up now. What is, so what is the representation of UV in this circuit? And we can come back to this discussion of uh, memory and uh, learning. And uh, what I would like to propose here is an, as a new principle, Pamela, this is for you, so that learning will occur at the lowest level to enable a causal inference on, influence on behavior. So the animal does not have to encode, okay, it's a 360, 380 nanometer light in the electromagnetic spectrum of 10 to the 12 photons per square meter per second. No? They don't have to encode that. They just have a chemical which, given the circuitry and given how these larvae behave, will mean for them if you have this chemical, then you should respond like this, which is downward swimming. So it's in a way, again, embodied this representation and depends on um, on how these animals are built and, and behave. Uh, so finally, coming back to this question, how is it possible that the same circuit drives upward swimming under pressure and under UV light it's, it drives downward swimming? And uh, we don't know the full answer yet, but we have kind of a biophysical or an embodied uh, cognition answer to that that we are trying to test with modeling and, and biophysical uh, uh, modeling and experiments, which uh, posits that if you have a body with an asymmetric center of mass and uh, you have cilia or motors all over the body and then you start to just upregulate one band of the cilia, if you make it faster, then you have something like a front wheel drive and then you will swim upwards. If you inhibit your head cilia, then the stable state will be head down and this is something like a rear wheel drive and then you will swim down. And so just uh, to encode this response, whether it's high pressure, let's go up, or UV, let's go, let's go down, this is really intrinsically coupled to the shape and biophysics of the body. And uh, the nervous system does not have to know, uh, it just has to find the solution to elicit the behavior, which for this particular body 
will make the consequence uh, advantageous for not being burned by UV or eaten by predator or uh, squeezed by high pressure. So this would be my take on embodied cognition, that you can't understand the brain without understanding the body and how it couples to the body. And thank you very much for your attention. So we, have, we have time for, for uh, several questions. Um, yeah, that, that was really fascinating, uh, Jacelli. So um, we can argue about whether or not the response to UV light represents memory. Um, you know, I, I think psychologists might call that adaptation. Um, but one of the things that I, I'm curious about is the startle response. As soon as I see a startle response, I want to see if it habituates. Have you looked? at habituation of the startle response in these organisms? Just non-quantitatively yet, it seems to habituate. We haven't yet studied that Yeah, I think thoroughly, that would be but... really, really interesting to yes. study. Yeah, because every startle response I know habituates, so. Yeah, very likely, yeah, it does. Okay, I'll ask a question then, unless there's other. Okay, so that was really, really cool. Um, one of the things I noticed in both the video for the phototaxis and the, the pressure taxis, bariotaxis, whatever that's called, um, is that not all of them go. So actually they form like there's a density gradient that looks very much like I could estimate Boltzmann's constant like Einstein did, but for this thing, right? So the question is like why don't they, if they're, I, I assume they're all genetically identical and they're all kind of trying, you would assume that whatever the thingy is that is evolved, it's probably trying to optimize the same deal. So, but the, the, the behavior seems quite non-deterministic. So I was just curious if you had any thoughts about that. Yeah, so the, there are some technical issues here. So the early phototaxis in these in this horizontal curvettes, some of them are simply just stick to the glass. So oh, they just stick to the they, glass. There are some which are just not. Okay, that's uh, less interesting. Than... But, but then there is this behavior of flexibility in the, in the later stages, also in phototaxis. Some will go to the light, some will go away from the light. Mm. Which is, so it's modulated by several other inputs like temperature and, and mechanical cues. Mm. And uh, so... Um, that that's not a uniform population, maybe huh. also because of their past experience or modulatory um, yeah, state. Yeah. I wonder if that's evolved as kind of a bet hedging strategy because you've got billions of these things that you've uh, made or whatever right. as a, like the little babies. Yeah. Okay, whatever. Anyway, that's cool. Any other questions? All right, without that, let's thank, thank our you. speaker again.